Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kara, um, and I work for Medtronic. Tonight, I have the pleasure of hosting this webinar where you'll get to hear from Dr. Brian Rabin. He's not only an obstetrician gynecologist, but also a urogynecologist, which is a physician who has completed additional years of fellowship training and certification in female pelvic health medicine and reconstructive surgery. He's also my personal physician, and I cannot speak more highly of him. Tonight, Dr. Raven is going to be speaking on overactive bladder, stress incontinence, and urinary retention, all of which he specializes in. He'll also discuss a therapy called InnerStem that helps to treat those conditions. And as I mentioned, I work for Medtronic, and that's the company that has developed this therapy. While you may know or not know the name Medtronic, you probably do know someone who has a pacemaker, and that's what we're most known for. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic off to Dr. Raymond. Um, before I do, just a few quick reminders. You've seen them on the screen here. Um, everyone's phone has been muted upon entry. If you all have any questions, feel free to type it in the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. Just make sure um, that you choose panelists um, and not panelists and attendees so that only the panelists here are getting your questions and they will remain anonymous. I will read them all off at the end of the webinar. Um, and Dr. Raven will answer the questions following the presentation. And without further ado, Dr. Brian Raven. Thank you, Kara, and thank you to everyone for being on this evening. Uh, Kara, if you'll go to the first slide. <clears throat> um, I've been um, doing urogynecology and dealing with uh, incontinence for almost uh, 20 years, dating back, and um, urine leakage is absolutely one of the most common things that uh, we see in our office along with prolapse and so forth. And overactive bladder, stress urinary incontinence, and urinary uh, retention um, are, uh, as I said, we see this on a daily basis. And over the course of many years, um, <clears throat> all we had for urine leakage was what a lot of people would refer to as a bladder tack and so forth, but in the last couple of decades, the amount of uh, or the different types of therapies we have for treating these problems has multiplied greatly. Can you go to the next slide, Kara? So 44% of patients, of people say they are embarrassed to talk about bladder control problems. And as high as this number is, this is still uh, an improvement compared to what, uh, when I started doing this about 25 years ago, this number was considerably higher. And this is typical of the patients that come in our office that they tell us that they are rearranging their schedule um, to go to the bathroom, their bladder is running their life, um, their bladder is controlling their activities. And um, we get some sort of similar complaint to that on a daily basis. Next slide. So our purpose uh, here tonight is to talk to you about the different types of therapies we have available for not only overactive bladder, which is what InnerStem has a designed a therapy for, but urinary retention and stress urinary incontinence as well, which is the classic leakage with coughing, sneezing, laughing, running, jumping, picking up something heavy, et cetera. Next slide. So first we're going to talk a little bit about um, understanding how bladder control works. We're gonna talk about the care pathway that a lot of urogynecologists and physicians that are interested in urinary leakage employ. The treatment options, we'll spend some time talking about the Medtronic bladder control therapy, otherwise known as InterStem, and then we'll have time to take your questions and answers. Next slide. First of all, this is probably one of the most common questions I get from patients, is patients will come in complaining of some issue with their bladder, stress urinary leakage overactive bladder and a lot of times they'll look me right in the eye and say, Dr. Raven, do you ever hear 
of other patients complain about this problem. And it's, it's amazing that even today in 2021, that it is not realized not only by patients, but it's also not realized by healthcare providers how common a problem this is. For example, overactive bladder, uh, one in six adults in this country has the criteria that would make the diagnosis of overactive bladder. Um, it affects men and women of all ages. It can uh, produce loss of confidence, loss of self-esteem, poor feelings of general health, loss of sleep. Um, we have uh, numerous patients that get up um, multiple times a night. Getting up one time a night is fairly common uh, to go to the restroom. Getting up two times a night um, is on the fence, but getting up three, four, or more times a night is, um, is abnormal. And this actually has been studied, and I'm, I like to point this out to my patients who complain of this problem, that one of the most common things that especially older patients are doing when they fall and break their hip, uh, for example, is getting up at night to go to the restroom. Uh, they typically feel that uh, they typically fall where? In the bathroom where the floor is hard. Um, typically there's not as much carpeting or padding. So it actually has been studied and overactive bladder in nocturia, for example, has been found to be an independent risk factor for hip fracture. And so one of the things we oftentimes take the opportunity to discuss with patients is, you know, if you are getting up a lot at night, Please make sure that there is a light on that you can see your path to the bathroom clearly. Make sure there are no obstacles on the floor like throw rugs and so forth. And, and don't rush. Um, a lot of patients will tell us when they uh, fell at night and, and suffered a fracture that they thought they were going to be able to make it. So they, uh, they kicked up the throttle just a little bit. But the sheer number of patients in this country that have issues with uh, overactive bladder is is astounding. I mean, all of us know uh, someone that has uh, vision problems. I mean, I wear contacts and, and reading glasses. All of us know someone that has diabetes. But if you look at this slide, you realize that the number of patients that complain of overactive bladder dwarfs the number of patients in this country with diabetes. That's a lot. Next slide. Um, urinary incontinence, and this is one of the things that I harp on a lot. I cannot tell you how many times in the last two decades I have been told, yes, Dr. Raven, my, my bladder is leaking, but hey, that's just a part of getting older. Um, that, is, that is not. Um, the fact of going more than eight times a day, getting severe urgency, which is a lot of women describe as I've got to go right now feeling uh, planning your activities around the, your bathroom access, um, not having that extra cup of coffee or that extra glass of water, especially in the evening, um, it, in an attempt to decrease the amount of urine leakage, or using pads to control your leaks. Um, if these are things that you suffer with or someone you know suffers with, your body's trying to tell you something. And urinary incontinence, just to emphasize, while it can become more common as you get older compared to younger age groups, it is not a normal part of aging. Next slide. So how does bladder control uh, work? Obviously, um, this is a very simplified view. I've actually been to national and international meetings where multiple lectures or half a day is spent uh, detailing the network that controls this. But in general, um, your kidneys produce urine, uh, sends it to the bladder. And when the bladder is about half full, this is somewhat variable depending on patients, it stimulates uh, certain nerves in your pelvis, which sends a signal to the continence center in the brain. And then that interacts then with your bladder and gives you your bladder the signal that it's time to empty. So this communication um, is essential for bladder control. 
Now, there is, it's slightly, this schematic is slightly different for overactive bladder issues uh, versus um, stress incontinence issues where there is a physical weakness in the urethral sphincter. Next slide. So what causes these bladder control problems? Obviously, daily habits. Um, I'm an iced coffee addict. You know, Dunkin' Donuts, when I pull through in the morning, they know exactly what to give me without just listening to my voice <coughs> on there. So, But caffeine is a really big uh, offender. Uh, sodas that are caffeinated, diet drinks, um, tea, and so forth. Sometimes patients develop a, not what I call a, a true sensitivity, but their body becomes more sensitive to consuming large amounts of these liquids especially it seems as you get older. Certain medications can certainly um, cause issues with your bladder. Um, as you get older, hypertension is a very common problem. And one of the best therapies for hypertension is a uh, diuretic or what a lot of people call my fluid pill. Um, and so when people suffer with hypertension or uh, congestive heart failure, these medications become a necessity. And so sometimes uh, the bladder was just hanging on by a thread, but then the adding in uh, something like a diuretic pushes someone over the edge. Other things, pregnancy, um, having a child vaginally um, can cause uh, injury to the pelvic floor. This injury can be muscular or it can be nerve injury that can subsequently affect how your bladder functions in the years and decades to come. Other things uh, kick into this, um, uh, genetic issues, age issues, uh, other um, medical issues like diabetes and so forth can all factor into this. Next slide. So the three most common bladder control problems are number one, stress incontinence. That is by far the most common, hence why we gave it um, uh, the number one setting here. Um, Stress incontinence is your classic, I cough, I sneeze, I laugh, I run, I jump, I leap. And that is, is what a lot of patients will come in and tell me, yes, doctor, so-and-so tacked my bladder years ago because I was leaking when I coughed or, and sneezed and so forth. Um, about 70 to 80% of patients that have urinary leakage have this type of problem. Or it can also be in combination with um, overactive bladder which is the next most common problem um, compared to stress incontinence. An overactive bladder, uh, generally you're going to have consist of four main complaints. Uh, urgency, where you get the strong urge that you cannot ignore, that you have to go to the restroom. Frequency, where you go into the restroom more often than you should. Urge incontinence, where you get the urge that you have to go to the restroom, but you cannot make it which provokes urinary leakage, and then nocturia, which is getting up and down excessively at night to urinate. You can have one of those things, all of those things, or a combination of those things, and have a diagnosis of overactive bladder. The least most common problem we run into is urinary retention. Urinary retention uh, can be neurologic, where it is from nerve damage. Uh, or it can be from a, a surgical procedure that has been done in the past. Next slide. Stress incontinence. As I said a minute ago, uh, leaking when you sneeze, cough, or laugh, exercise, going up and down stairs, standing up, getting um, in and out of a car, and a lot of times um, patients will decrease the intensity of their uh, physical activity. Um, the classic one that I, I hear from patients all the time, well, no, I don't get on the trampoline with my grandchildren because I will leak um, um, when I uh, get on the trampoline with them. Uh, we have patients, for example, that have been enjoying <clears throat> certain types of physical activity like tennis for years, but when they charge the net or sliding back and forth across the court, they will have um, urinary leakage. Um, and so a lot of times what patients will come in and then they'll realize that slowly over the course of time, uh, 
they have decreased their uh, physical activity to accommodate their bladder. Next slide. Urinary retention. Um, this is a problem where you cannot tell if your bladder is full. And the way it's manifested most commonly clinically is you are unable to fully empty uh, your bladder. The stream can be weak. Um, sometimes catheterization is needed. Uh, other times pe people just have sit in the, uh, on the commode for an excessive amount of time uh, to get the bladder empty. Next slide. And then finally, what is overactive bladder? Uh, we talked on this a second ago. Starting to urinate before you reach the bathroom, frequent leaks uh, after drinking a small amount of liquid. Um, this is a classic that we see frequently when you hear or touch running water. The classic one I run into is people are washing their hands or sometimes in the kitchen washing dishes. And the, they're like, you know, I just went to the bathroom and then that water touched my hands and off to the bathroom, I'm going again. Uh, I've had patients that say they will get into the, um, uh, get into the bathroom, urinate, get into the shower, and the water hits them, and they immediately have to get out uh, to urinate again. Urgency and frequency um, is, is a big part of it. Uh, with urgency, the frequent uh, uncontrollable urge to go more than eight times a day is abnormal. And a lot of patients will describe that they feel like their bladder is never empty uh, there. People compensate for this in all kinds of different ways. Uh, on the right here, you uh, hear this, see this woman saying, I never drink anything during meetings because I'm afraid I might, I might leak. And um, there's all kinds of compensations uh, patients will make during their lives um, to uh, accommodate this problem. Next slide. Um, there are many different uh, treatments uh, for these problems. Um, there are a lot of overactive bladder treatments uh, that we're gonna um, review here. Um, but there's also um, treatments for stress incontinence and, and so forth. Stress incontinence, um, a lot of times, is treated with um, a what a lot of people refer to as a bladder tack there. Um, it has been treated very successfully in the last 20 years with um, subureteral swings, uh, despite a lot of the issue uh, with um, mesh concerns a few years ago, uh, stress urine incontinence um, can be very successfully treated with the right type of subureteral swing. Uh, they are with a very high satisfaction rate. Oftentimes before we go to surgery, um, we will encourage someone to do physical therapy, perhaps with Kegel exercises and so forth. Um, but overactive bladder treatments, there are um, quite a number that we can discuss. Uh, that are really good options. Next slide. So the first way to get treated for overactive bladder um, or stress urinary incontinence is to get the right diagnosis there. Um, the right diagnosis uh, is key uh, for the therapy. I cannot tell you over the years how many patients I have had that have come to me um, that have had a bladder tack or sling done of some description for what turned out to be overactive bladder from the very beginning. And, um, and I've, I've seen it both ways. And so getting the proper diagnosis is critical to getting the right kind of, of care uh, there. Uh, lifestyle changes, um, certainly if someone, as I mentioned earlier, um, their um, uh, lifestyle changes um, are key. So, for example, if you're like me and, um, you know, love your iced coffee in the morning, two large iced coffees from Dunkin' Donuts, um, as you get older, uh, it may happen to me where your bladder is not going to accommodate that caffeine load. So that is what we mean by lifestyle changes or watching what you drink or watching what time of day you drink. 
if your biggest complaint is not curia getting up and down at night to run to the bathroom, then sometimes something as simple as limiting your fluid intake later in the day or in the evening can can be successful in helping you to manage them, the problem. And finally, with overactive bladder, the first thing that we typically try when lifestyle changes have not been successful is oral medications. Uh, oral medications for overactive bladder have been around a very long time. The first one that was out on the market um, several, several decades ago was a drug called Ditropan or Oxybutin. Um, when it was first out three or four decades ago, um, it was a drug that had to be taken four or five times daily, and the severity of the dry mouth that it caused severely limited its use. Um, in the late 90s, um, Detrol, which a lot of people have heard about, uh, was the newest one on the market. Um, it kind of ushered in um, a new era of these medications where they had less dry mouth, um, less side effects than the old Ditropan from decades prior. Um, almost all of the medications out there on the um, market, in my opinion, they have about a 30% chance of giving, giving meaningful long-term success in those patients that it helps. Um, the side effects with the medications are uh, dry mouth, uh, reflux, and constipation. And, and a lot of our patients, you know, prolapse uh, can, or uh, prolapse is where your bladder and or your vagina and or your rectum are bulging out of the vaginal opening. And a lot of times, um, overactive bladder type symptoms can coexist with prolapse. And so sometimes the side effects of the medications limit our use. So, for example, if someone has a large rectocele where the rectum is bulging up into the vagina and constipation makes that problem worse, then uh, it can severely limit our, um, our use of these medications. All of these medications are very similar. I'm fond of telling patients they're like first cousins or our first cousins once removed because there's very little difference uh, in between them, in my opinion. There's only one exception to that rule, which is the newest drug that has been out there, which is called Mirbectric. And Mirbectric is a uh, slightly different medication, um, but it is no more uh, effective than um, the other drugs at around 30%. And then finally, we have some advanced therapies that we're going to talk about. Next slide. Um, as we, we touched on this briefly just a few minutes ago, uh, simple solutions. We certainly do want to uh, try these um, diet, exercise, uh, bladder retraining, or biofeedback, pelvic floor strengthening. Pelvic floor strengthening or Kegel exercises, in my opinion, um, they do better for the stress urinary incontinence type issues. Um, however, uh, they, in some studies, have shown uh, some mild improvement in overactive bladder type complaints. But I tell patients the bottom line with Kegel exercise or pelvic floor strengthening is it never hurts and could um, have some other beneficial effects on the pelvic floor. Bladder retraining is uh, a lot of times performed by physical therapists and can be done at the same setting, uh, sitting, excuse me, or at a different um, uh, session where uh, some type of probe or, or device is placed in the vaginal area, occasionally in the rectal area, and the um, urge to urinate and, um, and the cues and so forth are worked on by the therapist so that... Um, I guess a good way to sum it up would be to say mind over matter to kind of retrain uh, what that continent center in the brain uh, is doing in this regard. Next slide. Oral medications, as we discuss, um, they must be taken daily, and we've already discussed the dry mouth. Uh, the Mirabectric that I mentioned is the one that can provoke some hypertension in some patients. The biggest thing that I run into with Mirabectric um, is that it really depends on the insurance plan as to whether or not patients can um, afford it. Is it 
it can be substantially expensive there. And this is very telling um, below. 72% of people said they stopped taking bladder medication within six months. A lot of that, my personal belief, is that a lot of that has to do with the what the effects the medication produces. It is very common when you start to take these medications that patients will notice a positive impact. And I tell patients a lot of times uh, you may see an improvement in your symptoms from, you know, four weeks to six weeks. And after that part time frame, for some reason, the effects just seem to start wearing off. I'm fond of telling my patients that if the effects persist, um, the positive effects from taking medications persist at two to three months, then you may be one of those 30% where the medication going forward may be beneficial. Next slide. Um, for patients that lifestyle changes um, and so forth do not produce um, the um, and the medication use don't produce the results that are desired. There are more advanced therapies for uh, overactive bladder, and these consist of Interstem, which is a device made by Medtronic, and also there are some injected medications, which some of you may know um, for overactive bladder. We also use uh, Botox for this. Uh, Botox, this is the same medication that started out as a cosmetic therapy for wrinkles in the face. It is now used for certain type of muscular spasms um, as well as migraine headaches, um, but it has definitely been proven it can be beneficial in the treatment of overactive bladder as well. Next slide. Um, injected medications, i.e. Uh, Botox uh, here, um, what it does is it paralyzes uh, different areas of the muscle. Uh, it is a very simple procedure to do. Um, we can do it in the office. We can do it in the surgery center. Um, we go in through a small camera into the bladder. We do not have to put patients to sleep. Um, and we just let a numbing medicine solution sit in the bladder for about 20 minutes. And um, it does not address the basic issue with overactive bladder, in my opinion, which is it's a nerve problem uh, with the bladder. But what it does is it uh, works on the muscle itself. Um, insurances will typically pay for this to be done uh, every three months, so up to four times a year. Uh, the patients that have used this successfully uh, in my practice typically end up having it done about once or twice a year. Um, the downside with the Botox is it does create um, a potential for self-catheterization uh, there. Um, years ago, we used to use a lot higher dose of Botox because we were using it uh, off-label before the research was finalized. Uh, we don't use uh, as high doses of Botox as we used to, but I still quote patients at least a 10% chance of urinary retention, which can lead to self-catheterization until the Botox wears off. Next slide. Interstem or the um, neuromuscular th um, neurostimulation therapy developed by Interstem um, it helps restore your bladder function. And by, you remember earlier, um, the little diagram we had uh, when I mentioned it stimulating the nerves. Well, the sacral nerves are what are responsible for um, proper control and functionality of the bladder. And it restores bladder function by uh, gently stimulating these nerves. It has been around since 1997. Um, this is the only therapy that I do for anything that I offer where you can test drive this therapy uh, before you actually have a permanent implant uh, performed. Um, it's the only thing I do that you can test drive, and it's the only thing I do that really is completely uh, reversible. Next slide. Um, for the test period for interstem, the way the regulations were written many years ago, 
is before insurances will pay for this therapy, which most insurances do cover this therapy, including Medicare, um, we have to do a test phase. And what we do is we uh, place you uh, face down um, uh, in the office or in the ambulatory surgery center setting. Uh, we use a little um, numbing medicine and put a temporary lead in uh, beneath the skin. And then you go about your regular activities. Uh, we personally in my office do about seven days. You record your symptoms. A lot of times the effects of it are apparent within 24 hours there. However, most patients are so surprised that it works within 24 hours, they don't believe it, uh, in my opinion. And then what happens is by the end of the 48 hour uh, or two days after they've had it put in, they started to go, wow, this is really helping. And then usually by three days, they're usually uh, pretty convinced. Next slide. Um, it has very proven results among um, multiple, multiple studies in the literature. Um, it is not only used in the United States, but it is um, um, used around the world. And incidentally, while we're here today to talk about uh, bladder issues, it is currently the number one treatment for leakage of stool in the world. Um, that was discovered by accident, uh, whereas a lot of patients, excuse me, a lot of physicians like myself, not only in the United States, but around the world, uh, were noticing that patients would come in and um, I would ask a patient, say, hey, uh, well, Miss Jones, how is your bladder doing since we put the interstem in? And the patient would say, well, you know, Dr. Ray, I'm very happy with it, but guess what? What? Um, I'm not leaking stool uh, either. And my, at first, my reply was always, well, Miss Jones, I didn't know you were leaking stool. And Miss Jones would always say, well, Dr. Raven, nobody ever asked me. And so that taught us some very important, uh, taught us a very important lesson. Um, as a whole, uh, obviously not just my practice, but your gynecologists and patient, uh, physicians that treat this problem worldwide uh, over the course of a few years started being a lot more proactive in asking patients about issues with stool leakage. Um, while at the beginning of the slide, 44% um, of patients, as, um, as we saw on that slide, feel uncomfortable discussing urinary leakage uh, with their providers, um, that number is dramatically higher if stool leakage is involved. We do have patients that have both urinary leakage and stool leakage, and a lot of times those patients, if they're having overactive bladder and stool leakage, it is not uncommon for them to get two for one. Um, this therapy is put in exactly the same as it is for the bladder as it is for stool leakage. It has a very high satisfaction rate, almost 85%, and 76% um, of patients achieve success uh, with SNM, which is sacral neuromodulation, compared to 49% for medications. Our numbers are actually higher than that. Uh, we're right around 85 to 87%. Next slide. So who is a, um, who is a candidate for this type of therapy? And I would like to back up and even talk about, um, you know, we mentioned uh, stress urinary incontinence at the beginning and a little bit in the middle of the talk. But it is not uncommon for patients to have both overactive bladder, got to go, got to go, got to go, can't make it, and have stress urinary incontinence. I cough, I sneeze, I laugh, I leak. And the question we get in our office every single day is, well, doc, can you get one thing that will treat both of those? And the answer is no. Uh, overactive bladder and treatment of overactive bladder is very, very different than treatment of stress urinary incontinence. You can try different things concurrently. For example, you can try medications for overactive bladder and you can try pelvic floor therapy for stress urinary incontinence at the same time, and that would be uh, completely acceptable. But there is not a surgical uh, procedure or a simple procedure that can affect both stress urinary incontinence and overactive bladder. What, who do we start with or uh, what problem do we start with treating first? That is a very, very 
individualized question for the patient. But in general, my rule of thumb is um, if someone uh, has a lot more complaints with overactive bladder or the testing that we do seems to indicate that, you really want to start, in my opinion, with the overactive bladder complaints first. Let the smoke clear, as I'm fond of saying, and then um, deal with the stress urinary incontinence. So for overactive bladder therapy uh, for with interstem, if you have significant symptoms that have not been amenable to lifestyle changes and oil and medications, or you've had side effects from these medications, um, or or you don't feel like your your quality of life has improved to the point um, that you would like for it to, you may be a candidate for interstem. Next slide. So uh, there are certainly uh, physicians uh, um, around that do this, but what has always struck me as interesting is there's a tremendous number of physicians that don't know that this therapy exists. Uh, I personally have been doing this therapy for about 13 um, years. Um, I um, Advanced Gynecology, um, we are uh, in partnership with Advanced Urology, and together uh, we do among the most, or I think the most, um, interstem procedures in the country uh, currently. Um, why is that? Well, we, I am very, very, very interested in overactive bladder and fecal incontinence. Um, I was already doing interstem a number of years ago for overactive bladder, and then a, a, a good friend of mine at Harvard invented a new procedure for fecal incontinence, and I was one of the 12 locations in the country that uh, offered the therapy in a research setting. And at that point in time, I became very interested in fecal incontinence, and we started seeing more and more of that. And these days, um, we're doing as many for uh, stool leakage as we are for um, overactive bladder. So we have gotten um, a lot of experience uh, with neurostimulation. But the, 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 the big thing here, while interstim is an absolutely fabulous therapy, the, the big message that I want people to leave with tonight is, you know, urinary leakage is, is not something that just happens as you get older. It's not something that, that you have to live with. There are therapies out there that can be that can work from physical therapy for stress urinary incontinence to surgical therapy for stress urinary incontinence and for overactive bladder. Um, there are medications, um, there's interstem, there's Botox. Um, and for urinary retention, I didn't really talk on that um, as much but the major treatments for that are uh, chronic catheterization, uh, if it's a nerve issue or interstem. Um, it's always struck me as strange that interstem can uh, work so well for overactive bladder, but also work extremely well for urinary retention. And success rate for urinary retention uh, stemming from a nerve issue is exceptionally high. Uh, way in the 90 plus percentile. Next slide. All right, I think that um, is all of our slides. Do we have any questions? So we have one question so far. Um, this patient asked, I have OAB and not obstructive urinary, urinary retention. So she self catheterizes. Um, she's tried everything, including Botox and Interstem, and nothing has worked for her. Um, she tried the interstem three years ago. Um, she said, are there any other therapies or would it be worth trying the interstem again? Uh, that's a very good question. And I think that um, in this particular one, um, I would be interested to know that this patient have any neurological issues, uh, any types of peripheral neuropathies or, or things like that that are stemming from uh, diabetes or, um, you know, something like multiple sclerosis or, or some other nerve, nerve issue there, because uh, so one of the biggest things um, we have I've seen in, um, in patients where interstem has failed, um, sometimes it's worthwhile to have it attempted again by someone that has done a great deal of it. 
Um, some, but does everyone I'm working me? And the answer is no. But our success rate with it is is extremely high. And the nice thing about Interstem is that um, there's just no downside to to trying it. There's just no downside to trying it, and there's no downside to retrying it because it's not a major surgical procedure. Uh, there's really no side effects uh, with it whatsoever. Next question is, can I have an MRI if I have an inner stem and I snow ski, what if I fall on it? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, number one, uh, you can uh, have an MRI with it. This is um, uh a fairly recent development in the last few years. Um, for many years, the answer was, is you could only have an MRI as long as the MRI was from the neck up. Um, and that came out of some data out of Canada uh, with it. But recently through some design changes and subsequent FDA approvals, uh, a patient can have an MRI from head to toe um, and it will not interfere with the device or cause any damage to the nerve. Uh, it, uh, the inner stem now uh, uses something called SureScan uh, technology, uh, which uh, almost every single um, uh, radiologist is uh, is used to dealing with. As far as uh, snow skiing, there that's a great question. I would say I probably wouldn't have it done today and go snow ski tomorrow. <laughs> um, I think that. Um, the further away you get from the implant, the safer it's going to be. Uh, many years ago, I had a patient that had it put in. Um, she had had some major, major, major bladder issues, um, had to have her urethra rebuilt um, up at Duke University many years ago, and subsequently developed some severe overactive bladder problems. Had the inner stem put in, it was working perfectly. She was so excited. And uh, went out and water skied and was uh, jumping the wake and kind of got slammed on the surface of the lake about eight or nine days, um, you know, after the inner stem was implanted. And uh, I had told her, obviously, not to do <laughs> anything like that, but it did. It moved the lead. Um, the good thing is, is that um, typically when leads are moved, uh, whether it's a pacemaker, a chronic pain stimulator um, or inner stem, um, we can uh, fix that. And so uh, we were able to fix that patient's problem. But great question. I would say I would, um, if I was a big snow skier, I would have it put in probably after the snow seat, after the snow skiing season ended and not ski until next year. And I think you would be fine. The next question is, can a fall cause OAB? Can a what? I'm sorry, Kara. Sorry, can a fall cause OAB? Uh, very good question, too. And the, obviously, if the number of patients that have overactive bladder that have had back injuries, back surgeries, some type of trauma, be it traumatic childbirth where they um, had really struggled to get a, um, a baby out of the uh, vagina or they had an injury to the pelvic floor from forceps or something along those lines um, or a fall. I mean, there are patients that have fallen, for example, uh, and, and landed right on their, quote, tailbone on a very hard surface or falling down stairs and so forth where maybe they were banged up but it didn't require any surgical intervention and I think I would best answer that by saying um, if you had an underlying issue or already had suffered some type of injury um, even if you didn't know it maybe you damaged some nerves and you didn't know it uh, uh, pushing out a large baby, and then you fail, and especially depending on how you fail and how you hit, um, I think uh, the answer to that is yes. It could push you over the edge into it, depending on the situation. 
next question is, I believe I have overactive bladder, but it started right after my partial hysterectomy. Is this common? Um, very good question there. Um, it depends on uh, how the hysterectomy was done and uh, was it a difficult one? Did it involve a lot of dissection of the bladder flap off of the uterus itself? Sometimes if uh, we do a lot of uh, cases of severe endometriosis in our practice, and uh, we also did one recently where there was an exceptionally large fibroid um, right underneath the bladder uh, there, and it required a major dissection around the bladder to get it to move out of the way. For dissections like that, or if there was an injury at the time of the hysterectomy, or if a hysterectomy was radical, uh, like for cervical cancer, then it certainly could affect or, um, or push someone over the edge and overact the bladder. Most of the time, not only for incontinence, but even for prolapse, we tell people it's a multifactorial problem, meaning that a combination of certain factors uh, add up to producing prolapse or in, in this, this lecture, uh, overactive bladder. So the same person who asked about snow skiing asked how soon after the implant would they be allowed to exercise and weight train? Okay. Um, very good question. I would say as far as running, uh, walking, elliptical work, cycling, and so forth, that could be done very, very quickly. Um, as far as um, if someone is does yoga. I think there are people that do some <laughs> do yoga, like my kind of yoga, which is not very involved. And then there are other people that get into some, to some contortions that I could never possibly achieve. Um, those patients that really um, get into what I call pretzel shape with yoga or, or, or stretching or so forth, those are the people that have to be, I think, really careful, especially in the first three months or so after after interstem, um, because you can really that portion of the back back there over the tailbone, you could really move the lead there. Now, as far as getting back in, if you're going to be a um, um, if you're going to be a deep squatter, you know, for example, you squat all the way down. Uh, once again, you would want to wait um, several months, uh, three months or so before you did that. Um, and then at that point, I tell people always to make sure they don't do anything violent. So, for example, slow controlled exercise is great, but at the same time, um, don't jump from squatting 100 pounds to squatting 200 pounds and do this violent motion to get the weight back up. Um, just like you should anyway, you should build up to that. But I think it's very important when you have a, a stimulator lead. Let's say something like that happened, Kara. Let's say somebody didn't listen and went and did, uh, you know, crazy yoga um, and, and got themselves into some contortions. Um, and let's say the lead moved. Is that the end of the world? And the answer is no. Um, if it was causing any problems, what they would do is cut the device off and then just come to the provider that put it in there. But these therapies, you know, I tell patients, um, especially with these and the other bladder therapies that you do, you can't live in, you can't live in fear at a certain point. You certainly need to, to be smart and allow your body and everything to heal, whether you're having a bladder tack done or inner stem put in or whatnot. But at a certain point, your whole uh, purpose in doing these therapies is to help restore your quality of life. And, um, you know, when I do in a major prolapse procedure, you know, I tell people frequently for the first six weeks, nothing heavier than a gallon of milk, which in the United States is 8.6 pounds. From six weeks to 12 weeks, I tell them to try to limit it to 25 pounds. And at 12 weeks, I tell them, you know, you just got to live your life. I mean, your whole point in doing this prolapse work or whatever is to restore your quality of life so you can enjoy those uh, therapy, those those activities that you that you enjoy. Um, 
The next question is, once inner stem is installed, is it permanent, meaning does it ever have to be replaced? Um, inner stem, once it's installed, it certainly can be permanent, but the bladder can, uh, excuse me, the battery or the device can need to be replaced. There are two options with inner stem currently. Um, as long as the device is working and working correctly, the lead itself never has to be touched. Um, we have two options for batteries. We have a battery that um, uh, you do not recharge. Uh, typically, Medtronic says it'll last about three to five uh, years, depending on the setting. Um, our patient's batteries are lasting about seven to eight years. Changing the battery is a very easy thing to do. It is also done for pacemakers and so forth. Uh, Interstem or Medtronic does have a new option. They have a small battery that has some amazing uh, battery technology that is rechargeable. Um, and for some patients that are really interested in that, um, they um, that are really interested in that, uh, that is an option there. But um, the device, um, I think the times that I have uh, I am going to need to remove the device um, is going to be dramatically lessened by the MRI compatibility that we have. Uh, in the past, when people had to have an MRI like of the knee or the hip or the lower back for some other reason, um, that would be the main time we would ever remove the whole device. And now with the MRI compatibility, we're not going to have to do that anymore. That same person asked if her OAB is caused by MS, will inner stem still work? Uh, it can, and that is one of the um, uh, problems years ago that was so frustrating for me is that a lot of times patients that have multiple sclerosis will have a very overactive bladder. You know, the 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 way overactive bladder. Uh, um, uh, excuse me, uh, my apologies, the way multiple sclerosis advances can be very different from patient to patient. But a lot of times in a, in a typical patient where it's advancing, the patient can have a very overactive bladder, but then ultimately it turns into urinary retention. Uh, the overactive bladder component, uh, it, yes, inner stem can help it. But in the, in the past, it, its use was limited because of the MRI uh, incompatibility. And a lot of times, MRIs were used to follow disease progression with MS. But the answer is, uh, is yes. Now, will it work forever in MS? Um, that's something I can't answer. Um, but yes, it can. Uh, we've had patients that's made a dramatic improvement. Next question asks, is the device worn outside of the body or inserted surgically? So maybe you could differentiate between the test versus the permanent implant. Yes, ma'am. With the test, the device is worn on the outside of the body with the leads temporarily implanted underneath the skin right over top of the, um, right over top of the sacrum uh, there. Um, in the... Uh, um, the permanent one, however, it is completely buried underneath the skin. Um, there is nothing on the outside at all. The patient has a remote control-like device that looks like a cell phone, a droid cell phone, that they can use to turn it off, turn it on, turn it up, turn it down. Uh, why would you want to do that? Um, certainly, uh, I think I saw a question that popped up about going through uh, the airport or going through a metal detector um, you don't have to cut it off. I think it's probably not a bad idea to cut it off because you can certainly feel it if it's on and you go through the metal detector. But the biggest thing there that can sometimes happen is, uh, um, you know, you might lose some um, of the programming in it if, it if it's on and you go through it. And by cutting it off, you can, um, you can avoid that. Um, certainly, if you go into a courthouse, uh, sometimes it's good to cut that off. Um, you know, when you go through there as well. And it really depends too on how much they have the intensity turned up on the, on the scanner there, the metal detector. And, and, 
Medtronic will provide anybody with um, the inner stem device implanted a uh, permanent implant card. And so you would just present that anytime you would need to go through any sort of security and just let them know that you had an implanted medical device and they would let you not go through the metal detector, essentially. Okay, the next question, you've already kind of answered this, um, but this woman said, it, I fell this summer and since that time I have overactive bladder. Do you think that that has something to do with it? I, I most certainly do, and I think that uh, uh, if it was that cut and dry, I, I think it's entirely possible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, this patient's bladder was lacerated. She's wondering if that will cause overactive bladder. If it will, if it will cause it or develop it, not necessarily. Uh, we have patients whose bladders are lacerated frequently. Uh, at the time, for example, of emergency C-section or at the time of hysterectomy, if patients have had multiple other, multiple other surgeries, for example, if a patient has had four C-sections, the scarring between the bladder and the uterus can be quite severe and the bladder can be lacerated a little more common in that. But I think it would really uh, depend more on how um, traumatic the uh, injury uh, to the bladder was, if it was a laceration all the way across the top of the bladder and then a lot of scar tissue and so forth developed, it might, it might could affect it that way, an overactive bladder. But um, most lacerations in the bladder are quite, are quite small, and um, I don't think those necessarily would cause any issues. The next question is, can a partial colectomy lead to overactive bladder? Um, it's a very good uh, question, and I think it would uh, depend on what the uh, colectomy was done for. So, for example, if it was done for diverticulitis, um, the dissection for that might be very different than the dissection for uh, colon cancer. And it would really depend on how far um, most colectomies are done and the sigmoid, which is on the left side. Um, and it would depend on how far medial or towards the middle of the person's body that the section, you know, went over the, over the sacral area. But depending on the reason the colectomy was performed and how big the dissection was, it's possible uh, there. I would, having said that, um, I would say if a colectomy was performed on the right side uh, or on the transverse colon, which is in the upper abdomen, uh, I don't think that that would necessarily produce any problems. Next question is, do you recommend the treatment for a 77-year-old? The oldest patient I have installed it in is 95 years old. That patient uh, was one of my um, longest standing patients. She had been a hairstylist for, you know, over 60-something years. She did not take new patients there, but she still took care of the ones she had that were still living, a lot of whom were in nursing homes and so forth. So every day she'd get in her car, drive to the nursing home or care center, um, cut these patients' hair that she had been taking care of for years. And so here she was. She was at 95, was living independently. Uh, was working, and, um, you know, her bladder, it was really bothering her. Uh, the nice thing about InterStem, and I think this is something important, this question is important, Kara, because it makes me also bring up the point that you do not necessarily have to be put to sleep to have this put in permanently. Indeed, um, for many years, I think I went probably three or four, maybe five years, and never put anybody to sleep to have this put in. There are some advantages to having it put in under heavy sedation, which is similar uh, to what is used for colonoscopy, which I know a lot of people are certainly familiar with. But um, I don't know that there's an absolute too old an age um, to, to have InterStem done. I'm very fond of telling patients that we do not discriminate in our office based on age. What we discriminate against is based on medical conditions. And so certainly um, if, if, a, if a patient's, you know, um, very ill and, and, and needs a, a liver transplant just to make up something, there are probably some surgeries and therapies that they're not going to be appropriate for. 
But as far as an absolute age, I don't know that there's an app, there's a cutoff for that because this is by far um, one of the safest procedures that I'm familiar with. Yep, there is no age limit to be certain. And um, like you said, your 95-year-old patient, we also had a 93-year-old patient just last week. So um, certainly a 77-year-old would be appropriate as long as all that other medical stuff checked out. Um, we have Absolutely. two more questions. Um, I have never had an OAB, or sorry, she means I've never had OAB until I went menopausal. Is that common? Uh, this patient has all of their female parts, never had any children or a hysterectomy. Hmm. That's um, a very good uh, um, question. And so what it goes to illustrate is that while traditionally for many, many years, um, uh, having vaginal births were the source of all evils in regard to urinary leakage. And it just demonstrates, number one, that's not the case. We have lots and lots of patients that have never been pregnant and never had a child vaginally uh, or C-section that have developed bladder issues. And there are certainly, um, um, without boring you with a, with a big lecture, um, patients are born with a certain number of nerves that are attached to muscles. And let's say um, the nerves I'm referring to here uh, exert the control over the bladder. And so through uh, the developmental process, when you're a, a little fetus inside of your mother, um, where those nerves are cut off uh, in the development of the fetus, uh, we know that that process is not consistent. So for example, Let's, I'm going to make up a number, and let's say you need 50 of these nerves and, and their associated muscles in the bladder to have excellent bladder control. And let's say the process in you, when you were born, you have 100 of these. And then in some women, maybe they have a big baby and it costs them a few nerves, and they're down to 90 or 80, or they're in a car accident or have back surgery or fall or, or something, or they get older. Nerves are one of the things that uh, age us. And so you can lose some of these nerves just by getting older. But my point is, is once you hit that 50 threshold, for example, and you get down into the 40s, then all of a sudden you can develop some incontinence issues, either overactive or for that matter, stress incontinence. And so Sometimes just the fact of um, of getting older and going through the uh, some of the changes that occur with menopause might be um, all it, all it takes, and some of that I think is set up genetic wise. Um, this is an area that's a very hot topic of interest, and I don't think anyone has a uh, definitive answer uh, to this question, but. Uh, I worked with a doctor at Emory that had done a good bit of uh, research into this years ago, and I think his hypothesis is not unreasonable. Pardon me, my dogs are losing it in the background. Last two questions. Um, can gaining a lot of weight cause overactive bladder, and can weight loss help your condition? Um, I think it can definitely aggravate it because if you think about it, if you were standing there with a full bladder and I looked you in the eye and then I poked you right in your bladder, you're going to feel like you need to run to the bathroom or you might even leak some urine uh, right there. And so uh, when uh, people are really overweight, it, you know, it affects so many things, you know, it affects our joints, uh, the development of arthritis, but the, the bladder and obviously in a female and a male for that matter are at the bottom of our abdominal cavities there, uh, in our pelvic area. And so you spend the vast majority of every day standing or sitting. So if you have a, um, you know, if you're really, really, really overweight, that's a lot of constant pressure um, on your bladder. And it absolutely, in my opinion, can aggravate it. Now, can it cause overactive bladder? I don't know if it can cause it from the get-go, but I do think it can certainly aggravate it. And I will say that I also do feel strongly that a lot of weight loss can certainly help with overactive bladder.
So unless there are any more questions that pop up here, I believe we are done. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so. All right, I'm not seeing any new questions pop up, Dr. Raven, so I will let you have your evening back. Um, I'm gonna go back to the screen here for everybody that's still on if you wanted the information for advanced gynecology. Um, and I noticed there were some males that joined, so if you'd like to seek treatment, you can um, also reach out to advanced urology, which is Dr. Raven's uh, partner practice. Um, and there's that contact information. And also, if you need to, um, you can go find a specialist in your area if you visit Medtronic.com slash bladder and then click find a specialist. Thank you so much, Dr. Raven. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carol. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.